because I've been aware of Charlie's work for a long time, always admired him very much. Well, it's true. Um, I was going to say something to the effect that uh, he was a child prodigy, and most child prodigies have the good sense to like burn out or become hermits or go somewhere, and so the rest of us can feel good about ourselves that, well, maybe we weren't as smart as he was, but we're kind of normal. But he just gone on to do more and more interesting things, and he's a really normal and nice guy, and our only hope for revenge is that he will be overshadowed by the successes of his daughters, a computational uh, biologist and a very talented musician. So we're just praying that, uh, you know, they'll teach him a lesson. But in the meantime, um, we're going to hear about extending uh, functions from finite sets uh, as uh, CM functions, aren't we? Yes. Okay. Uh, thanks for the very sweet introduction. Um, in, in fact, uh, uh, it, one of the great pleasures of a parent is, is, to, uh, is to go someplace and, and, uh, and have people recognize you. Oh, you're the parent of... And, and so I've, I've had that pleasure many times already. Um, okay. Uh, I, I'm very, very happy to be able to uh, dedicate this talk to, uh, uh, to the memory of, of Daryl Geller. Um, okay. Now, uh, let's see. I have been, I, I've been presenting this talk, which I have to confess doesn't have anything to do with Daryl's work. Um, many times uh, over the last few years, uh, I wonder uh, what the mean number of times is that the, uh, an audience member here has, has heard it. Uh, there will be something uh, new just at the end. Okay. Um, uh, let, let, let me just test out this tech. Uh, there, uh, there is a laser pointer. Okay. So there's the title. So we're extending, extending functions and uh, interpolating data. Uh, I, I want to acknowledge uh, uh, my wonderful technical typist, Jerry Peck, who uh, uh, since retired, who um, uh, catapulted me from the 19th to the 20th century with, uh, so that we, we have these slides. Okay, so let me begin immediately with the take-home message. And the take-home message is the following. In 1934, Hassler Whitney posed several basic questions on extension of functions uh, from uh, uh, funny sets in Rn to, to the whole of Rn. And these questions have been answered in the last few years. Um, and the solution of those problems has given rise to a new algorithm for interpolation of data. Okay? Uh, that's, that's joint work of mine with uh, Boaz Klartog. Um, okay, the new algorithm is theoretically best possible in a way that I'll explain, but is not practical. And therefore, I've kept on working, uh, working on it in the hopes of eventually getting something of practical use. And this has the consequence that uh, also uh, my, I mean, until such time as I'm able to get something useful, uh, maybe I'll just keep on giving roughly the same talk over and over again. <laughs> OK, so here's the plan of the talk. Uh, first, I'm going to explain the setting by which I mean just a few definitions and just a little bit of notation. Then I'm going to state Whitney's classical problems. Uh, they are now solved, but I'm not going to give the solutions because that would take too long. Instead, I'm going to state the problem of interpolating data. Uh, uh, first, I'm going to state the problem in a way which uh, contains lots of um, loose talk. Uh, and so uh, in order for the problem to, to be a, a, an actual math problem, uh, I'll have to give several clarifications. So next come the clarifications. And then when we've got the problem of uh, interpolation of uh, data uh, stated carefully, then I'll give the statement of the main results and then some ideas from the proofs. Uh, and although I, I uh, don't say this here, uh, if there's time, um, I, I think there will be time, a little bit, uh, two minutes about the new stuff. Okay, the setting. So uh, uh, we're going to fix positive integers m and n. They will always mean the same thing. And they mean simply that the function space we're going to work in is CM of Rn. So constants that depend only on M and N depend only on which function space we, we use. And the, uh, when, when I say CM of, R, of Rn, what I mean is continuous functions, continuous real-valued functions uh, with M continuous derivatives such that the norm, which you see written there on the slide, is, is finite. Okay, so the functions together with their derivatives up to order M are bounded. Now, uh, uh, why those spaces? Well, they're, the, they're perhaps the easiest to work with, but it would be, I mean, and any analyst would like to work also in Sobolev spaces. And, and the new stuff is that it looks as if uh, uh, Sobolev spaces, which, which appear to be impenetrable 
uh, as, as uh, from the point of view of these problems, um, uh, that they're, they're now wide open. And uh, in the version of the talk a couple of years from now, I feel pretty confident that uh, there will be complete results. OK. Uh, all right, on with the setting. So we've got CM of Rn. Now, uh, I'm going to uh, use the symbol Jx of f, the jet of x, uh, the jet at x of f, to be simply the mth order Taylor polynomial of f at x. I'm not on a manifold. I'm just in Rn, so that's a good enough definition of a jet. Okay, and and here I've even written out uh, to make everything whoop to make everything completely explicit. I've even written out what the mth order uh, Taylor polynomial looks like, and the the point to remember is just that. The information that it encodes is simply the function value at x and all the derivatives up to order m. So that's the jet. Now, where does the jet live? The jet lives in the vector space script p of all real uh, polynomials of degree at most m. Uh, and so that means that the, the jet of x, here let's use the pointer, the jet of x belongs to the vector space script p. OK. And uh, that's, that's enough notation and definitions. OK. So now l let me state. The Whitney problems. Uh, p please interrupt. I mean, this, is, this is intended to be completely easy and completely elementary, and anything that isn't completely easy and elementary has been edited out. But nevertheless, if I succeed in, in screwing it up and making something less than clear, please interrupt me. OK. So Whitney's classic problems. OK. Um, the first and main one is, suppose you're given a subset E in Rn with no good properties at all, completely arbitrary e, well, non-empty. Uh, and we're given, we're given a function f uh, mapping e to r. How can we tell uh, whether this function little f extends to a function capital F in cm? So how can we tell whether there exists capital F in cm such that capital F is equal to little f on e? That's the question. OK. Uh, if such an extension exists, how small can we take its cm norm? What can we say about its jet at a given point, which may lie in or near uh, the set E? And can we take the extension capital F to depend linearly on the given function little f? OK, the, uh, um, the simplest uh, of all the answers to all these questions is the answer, whoop, is the answer to this third. Can we take it to depend linearly? And the answer to that question is yes. OK, um, all right. So, um, let me, let me say a little bit about the work that was done on Whitney's problems. The, the reason for this subset of the talk is so that I uh, do a less than complete job of giving inadequate credit to others. Okay. So um, all right, already in 1934, Whitney did, so he posed the question. He, he solved it in one dimension. Uh, he, he solved uh, an easier uh, but very important problem by proving the Whitney extension theorem um, many people in this audience know the Whitney extension theorem. If, if you don't, then perhaps the biggest deficiency of this talk is that you're not going to find out uh, from me. OK, uh, but, but Whitney did that. And then uh, nothing much happened, as far as I know, until 1958, when the French mathematician Georges Glaser gave a solution uh, to the case of uh, one of C1 functions on Rn using a geometric uh, construction called the iterated paratangent space, which I'm also not going to describe. OK. Um, uh, let's see. Two uh, Soviet, now Israeli, mathematicians, Yuri Brudny and Pavel Schwarzman, um, uh, came up with the idea of finiteness principles. The simplest finiteness principle to state is, is the following. Suppose we're not working with C2, but with C11, which we heard about from, for instance, from Eli's talk, C11. Um, suppose, that, um, suppose that we're trying to extend some function from a subset of the plane, and we would like to get a C11 extension. One obvious, I'm sorry? First derivative, First derivative Lipschitz. Thanks. OK. Uh, then one obvious necessary condition is that if you pick out any six points uh, in that set, that there is a suitable extension of the function from those six points. And that should have a norm. That extension should have a, a C11 norm bounded uniformly, independently of which six points you pick. Um, and what Brudny and Schwarzman discovered was that if, if that's true, then you can, extend, you can solve the whole extension problem. And in fact, six is the best possible constant. 
and more generally in dimension n there is a weird formula for the minimum number of points, namely 3 times 2 to the power n minus 1. Okay. Uh, they discovered, I'm taking too long with this, but uh, they, I, uh, they, the reason that they discovered this was that uh, being in the, isolated in the former Soviet Union, they did not have access to uh, Whitney's work, and they uh, thought to themselves, what must he have done? Oh, he must have done that. But in fact, they did it. Okay. Um, uh, all right. More recently, um, Edward Bierstone, Pierre Milman, and Vislav Pavlusky in 2002 figured out a, um, a version of the, uh, higher, uh, uh, the higher of the iterated paratangent space suitable to higher derivatives, um, and, and that made it possible to think about a complete solution to Whitney's problem. Uh, and I got involved and, and had success with, uh, by solving uh, uh, all the problems that I uh, mentioned before. And if you want to read about it, then the simple algorithm is to go to my website, which is there, and, and um, just look immediately at the bibliographies of my papers, and uh, you, you'll see uh, you know, the references. You, you'll see what, what people have done. OK. All right. But, but again, that's what I don't want to talk about. OK. What I do want to talk about is the problem of interpolation of data. And I claim that this is, so I'll state it, but I claim this is an important applied problem. All right, so let's have a look. What, what is the problem? Well, again, we fix our, our same integers, m and n, as before. There they are. We work in cm of rn, same as before. We're given a function, real-valued function, defined on e, but this time e is finite. Let's say it's n. Now, we want to extend it, but maybe the extending function isn't required to agree perfectly with the original little f, and therefore we're given a tolerance. That's this function sigma, which maps e to uh, non-negative real numbers. Um, and uh, let's see. So if we take sigma to be identically zero, that's going to dim that's going to mean in the next slide or two. That's going to mean that our extension function capital F has to agree perfectly with the data little f on the set E. Uh, whereas if sigma is big, then that will mean that we really don't require such a good e extension, uh, uh, such a close agreement. Uh, sigma tells us. Um, how close an agreement we demand, and it will vary, you, it will vary from point to point, and it's user supplied. Okay, it can be anything. Okay, and now uh, the way I want to state the problem of um, uh, extension of, uh, or, you know, fitting of data is, is on the slide now. We want to compute a function f in CM, and we want to compute a number capital M so that the stuff in the box happens. First of all, the CM norm of capital F is at most capital M, and furthermore, the, little, the capital F agrees with the data little f um, uh, to within m sigmas. Uh, and that's true for all points of, of the set E where the function little f was given. And we want to do this with capital M as small as possible. Now, it looks, it looks very strange that this m is the same as this m. Right? That's unnatural. I think everything else looks natural. Okay. Uh, how do we deal with the fact that, that's, uh, that those m's are the same? And the answer is, I didn't tell you what sigma is. And so if you want two different m's, you're free to take them, and you just uh, rescale sigma. And we're back here. OK? OK. So, so now with, with that explanation, I, I think you'll agree this is a natural problem. OK. Uh, and of course, the world is full of data. The world is full of functions that we would like to understand, and we don't know what they are exactly, but we know approximately what they are at finite sets. Why do and, you want to interpolate data? <laughs> ah, OK. Um, so let's see. Why? OK. So um, how, do you, how do you decide anything? OK. You, right, you know better than essentially everybody else how hard it is to prove something, right? So that's not what we do when we deal with any real situation. We have learned by example, oh, you know, don't touch the fire because bad things happen. Um, the, uh, if, you, if there's anything that you want to, to predict, to understand, to, to respond to, you a priori you don't know. But you have been given some examples, and you try to deduce something from the examples. And, and the, um, the reason that the, the, the norm should be less than something or other is that, for instance, suppose, here, uh, let, let, me, let me work over here. Suppose that there's a function, and I tell you, here are some values for it. Okay, 
then a natural thing to do is to, is to guess that. And a less natural thing is to guess that. Whoop. But they fit the data equally well, but this one is smoother than that one. That's why. Okay. Um, oh, there, there are other reasons also. There's, there's the computational geometry reason, uh, but let's stick with this one. Yes? Right. So, certainly, 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 or, or, or perhaps there's an image and you don't see all of the image. So, yes, yes, okay. Does your so, M depend on little m? Does my, I'm sorry, my capital M or my capital M? Capital M. M. Part, of, part of the, yes, the capital M will depend on little f. So, so if I give you completely wild data, capital M is going to have to be big. Okay? Okay, I, I, hope, I, I hope we're happy with those explanations because I think if you aren't happy then now, then you won't be happy later either. Sure. Yes. Oh, that is, a, that is a very good question and I don't know how to answer it. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay, onward. So this is the problem. Notice, notice that this problem is not carefully formulated. For instance, oh wait, no, no, don't notice that yet. Instead, look at the slide. Uh, I'm going to define, so I'm going to define the norm of little f with respect to e and sigma. And it's simply the inf of all the m for which it's possible to do this. And so that's somehow the, the, the best we can do. It is a norm. That's why I made this m equal to that m. This thing is now a norm. Uh, um, the inf needn't be attained. That's true in elementary examples. Let me not bother you with the elementary examples. I promise you that if you sit down and think about this for 20 minutes, you will find several examples. So it's only an inf. So when I say the least possible m, I mean the inf. OK, fine. So um, OK, so, so therefore, um, in an, all right, so now uh, I'm going to define then a C optimal interpolant. The very best one doesn't exist. The very best one would have the smallest m. So I'm going to define a C-optimal interpolant, which is, which is something that, that does what the previous thing did and has um, m, which is as small as possible, up to a factor of C. So if C is not very big, we've done almost as well as we can do. And if C is humongous, we've done pretty badly. OK? So that's a C-optimal interpolant. OK? All right, so now the crude statement of the problems uh, of interpolation are as follows. Given the data, so there you recognize M, N, E, F, sigma. That's the usual stuff from the previous slides. First of all, compute a C optimal interpolant with C not too big. And secondly, compute the order of magnitude of that norm. And uh, that, uh, that's of interest because it tells us whether our data looks something like that or look something like what I would get if I just sprayed random points onto the blackboard. I could then fit that with, uh, with a, uh, the graph of a function, but it's not natural to do so because the norm of the function will inevitably be big. Okay, so those, those are the questions. Okay, but those, now I think I want you to, to refocus on how crudely stated those questions are. So, um, uh, whoop, still not yet, rats. Our solution will consist of an algorithm to be run on a computer. OK, now for the clarifications. OK, so uh, what does it mean that C is not too big? Uh, if we want a theorem, we'd better say what it means for C not too big. What does it mean to compute the order of magnitude of something? I need at least a perfunctory discussion of what's a computer, because I'm proving a theorem. So I need, you know, I need to say what a computer is. Um, Computers, whatever they are, compute finite numbers of, I mean, finite amounts of stuff, whereas a function is an infinite amount of stuff. So I need, I need to clarify what it means to compute a function. And it's all very nice to compute things, but if I have to wait 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 24th years before I see anything, I don't care. So uh, I, I need to be concerned with efficient versus wasteful computation. What are, what are the relevant computer resources? Uh, and and uh, how can we uh, optimize them? 
Okay, so that's what has to be clarified. Okay, onward. So not two big constants. Well, remember, we're working in CM of Rn. So constants called little c, big C, et cetera, mean uh, th those are constants that depend only on little m and little n. In other words, they depend only on the function space that we're working on. So um, uh, a not too big constant for me is going to be a constant that depends only on which function space we're working on. That sounds very natural to a mathematician, but if you're working on an applied problem and, um, and the constant c is 10 to, the, uh, 10 to the 10 to the 24th, and I tell you that that depended only on little m and little n, uh, you, you, you may be less than pleased. Okay. All right. Uh, <clears throat> yes, moving on. To compute the order of magnitude of something is, so, so imagine that x is some non-negative thing that we're trying to compute. Maybe I can't compute it exactly, but I can compute some other non-negative thing, y, which is guaranteed to be comparable to x in the sense of these inequalities. Remember, these constants, little c and big C, depend only on which function space I'm working in. And so if that's true, then I say that I've computed the order of magnitude of x. And again, of course, if you're, if you're, in, if you're working on an applied problem, order of magnitude may mean something somewhat different. OK. All right. Now, what about the computer? Uh, I need to spend a few minutes talking about um, uh, what's a computer. Uh, von Neumann gave a nice description of what a computer is supposed to be. It has a finite number of registers. It has lots of memory cells. There is a flow of control. Uh, I, I imagine that. Um, modern computers do parallel processing. Let's not bother with that. One could wonder, uh, um, one could wonder uh, uh, how parallelizable are the algorithms that I'm going to present. And in fact, I believe they're quite parallel parallelizable. But Let's not worry about that now. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm going to make, for purposes of this talk, one big simplification, which is that I'm going to assume that each memory cell in the RAM can hold one real number or one integer, no matter how big, and to perfect precision. Uh, so I'm assuming that, for instance, if I, um, if I multiply two real numbers together, uh, my, my idealized computer makes no round-off error. Uh, my basic operations are going to include the exponential, the logarithm, and the greatest integer. Okay? Uh, people who, who are, are interested in, in computer science will know that this is a, um, a very dangerous model of computation in which one can cheat by, uh, well, let, let me not explain further than that. If, if you're interested, we come back to it later. Uh, but it's possible to cheat. We do not cheat, and, and one reason I can say confidently that we do not cheat is that uh, this is only the version, uh, I mean, this is the version for public consumption, but if you go back and look at the paper, there is a long appendix which deals with the problem of computation in finite precision. So there's a rigorous analysis of the round-off error exactly to satisfy people who are aware that it is possible to cheat. Okay. All right. Uh, the next thing I'm supposed to clarify is what does it mean to compute a function? So again, our computer, even though it, it uh, does unrealistically good things with individual real numbers, it computes only, nevertheless, it computes only finitely many real numbers. A function consists of infinitely real numbers. What does it mean to compute a function? And here's what it means. So first we enter the data. Then we wait while the computer performs one-time work. Uh, after it's done with the one-time work, it signals, OK, ready, and then it responds to our queries. We enter queries, and each time we enter a, a query, the computer does a little work and answers our query. Uh, a query consists of a point of Rn, and the response to a query consists of the function value at that point and all the derivatives up to order m uh, at that point. And those are all the derivatives we have any right to ask for because the function was only supposed to be in Cm. OK? So uh, that's what I mean by computing a function. OK. Now, now let's talk about um, good versus uh, I mean cheap versus expensive computation. So what are the computer resources needed to compute a function? Well, there was this one-time work. How many computer operations uh, were required to perform the one-time work? When I say computer operation, I mean some elementary thing. Add two numbers together, or fetch a number from memory, or put a number in memory, or something like that. How many, com how many operations are needed for the one-time work, and also, how many operations are needed to answer a query once the one-time work is complete? 
Notice that it's much more important to drive down the query work than the one-time work, because as the name suggests, the one-time work is performed once, but we may uh, ask lots and lots of queries. Uh, if the query work is small, then, then what we've got here is sort of the equivalent of a pocket calculator, and every time we want, uh, we want to find the sine of an angle, we just uh, enter the angle, press the sine button, and out comes the angle. Okay. Um, okay, and there's one other thing that we need to keep track of in terms of, of how good a, um, what the resources are for a computation, namely, how many memory cells do we need in the RAM? How much memory? Okay, so number of operations of one-time work, number of operations of query work, and how much, how much memory. Those are the computer resources needed to, uh, um, to compute a function. Okay. Uh, one other very, very important point that I often forget to say, but fortunately it's written on a slide. Uh, I'm only interested in algorithms that always work in every case. Uh, if our set E, for instance, looks sort of like a lattice, then it's quite easy um, to, uh, to figure out uh, a reasonable interpolation algorithm. I, I'm, again, I'm not talking about practical problems. I'm talking about this theoretical setup. This, this problem is trivial if E looks at all like a lattice. Um, um, the, the, this, the very serious point is that I want, I want an algorithm that always works. Okay. Okay. So now, uh, uh, now we're ready to state the main theorems. Okay, and, and again, this joint work with Boas. Okay, so remember, uh, remember the problem we're given. Uh, we're given our M and N, which tell us the function space. We're given a finite set. Uh, we're given this, uh, uh, this finite set with, with capital N points. And on it, we're given a function little f from E to the reals, and a function sigma from E to the non-negative reals uh, telling us the, the tolerance, okay? That's the statement of the problem. I mean, th those, are, you know, those are the things that are given in order to state the problem. So given all that, the first theorem is that we can compute a C-optimal interpolant using n log n operations of one-time work, log n operations per query, and n, uh, n memory cells, okay? Now, remember these constants C depend only on little m and little n. They depend only on which function space we're working in. They don't depend on anything else. Uh, so in a minute, I'm, I'm going to argue that these, um, uh, uh, that, that these are, are very, very favorable numbers. Uh, but first, all right, second theorem uh, is that, uh, all right, fine, we computed the, opt the, uh, um, the C optimal interpolant. We also, remember, wanted to compute the order of magnitude of this norm uh, which was the best, whoop, the best possible m, uh, and that can be done with n log n operations and n memory cells of, of RAM. Okay, now uh, I let's see if this is on the next slide. But um, these theorems I claim. I'm sorry. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now I claim that theorems one and two are very likely to be the best possible. So in terms of computing f, the one-time work had better be at least n because you at least have to look at, at the data. You had better look at the function that you're supposed to approximate, and that takes n steps. And this algorithm takes n log n steps. Okay? Um, uh, how about the query work? The query work is at least one because you have to, say, look at the question and or print out the answer. Okay, so that's work at least one. And if you think back to the theorem that I just stated, the query work was log n. Okay? And finally, the memory has to be at least n because you had better at least hold the data. Um, you, you could think about um, receiving data on the fly and then discarding it, but I promise you, you, you have to be able to hold the data. Um, and, and that's easy to see, but I don't want to waste time going through the argument. Um, so the memory needed is at least n, and if you look at the statement of the theorem, the statement of the theorem says it's n times a constant. Uh, now, uh, all right, so these things are, I mean, the memory is absolutely best possible. Uh, the query work and one-time work can't be improved by better than a log. I believe they can't be improved at all. There are very, very, very few algorithms that work with, uh, I mean, that work in linear time. Um, 
Uh, Chris Bishop just spent uh, an hour ex or less than an hour explaining to me a remarkable algorithm that does the Riemann mapping theorem in linear time. Uh, and there's the algorithm, the wonderful algorithm of Ingrid Dobschies that computes um, wavelet coefficients in linear time. But algorithms that work in, in linear time and do anything uh, serious are very few and far between. That's not a proof. I don't have a proof. Uh, I simply believe that these things are best possible if for this problem. Okay, and how about for computing the order of magnitude of, of the norm that is of the best possible m? And the work, the work needed is at least n, and the storage needed is at least n, uh, because, again, because simply you have got to look at the problem. And uh, uh, that's the size of the problem. And, and so the storage, uh, a, again, is, is then optimal, up to a constant multiple. And the work needed is, I mean, according to this trivial remark, cannot be improved by more than a log. And I guess it cannot be improved at all. OK. Um, now, that's all very nice in theory. So, so we can feel very happy with the theoretical talk. On the other hand, this is, I claim, a very serious applied problem. Uh, so we should ask, is it useful? And the answer is no. And here's why. So the algorithms aren't practical because they compute a C-optimal interpolant for a large constant C. OK. There were lots of constants C in the statement of the theorem. Here, let me take advantage of this technology and go, I mean, look, look for example, uh, look at theorem one. We've got a C optimal interpolant. That's for one constant C. For a different constant C, we have that number of operations of one time work, this number of operations per query, and this uh, number of memory cells. These three constants C, uh, so although I call them all C, they're different constants. These three constants C are not very big. This constant C is enormous. Um, and therefore, this is not a practical algorithm. Um, so I've been, all right, uh, I, I don't want to simply uh, declare victory and let other people worry about doing something useful. Um, so, so I, I mean, there has been, all right, so I've been working for several years to try to come up with a useful version of this algorithm. And I have some partial results, which I'm not going to bother you with, which has the consequence that this talk doesn't vary from year to year for, uh, for the last few years. OK. Uh, some ideas from the proofs, if there's time. Let's see. I see it's, um, it's about 12 minutes of 6 by my watch. When should I, when should I quit? 6.15. OK. 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 Some ideas from the proofs. OK, so we're going to define some convex sets gamma. Then we're going to compute their approximate size and shape. Then we're going to use them to compute the function f. Um, so what are the gammas? Well, remember, remember these letters of the alphabet, let a little m, little n, e, f, sigma. They specify the problem, OK? For each, for each point x in Rn, and for each capital M, I'm going to define a convex set, gamma of xm, in the space P. Remember, P is the vector space of all possible Taylor polynomials. OK? Um, so this is a convex set, but I make once and for all the convention that the empty set counts as a convex set, and this convex set might be empty. OK? So this is the basic object. So, so, um, uh, we're going to succeed by asking the right question. The right question is, how do we compute gamma? All right, so what is gamma? Well, so suppose, oh, all right, well, there's the definition. <laughs> gamma of xm is the set of all Taylor polynomials at x of all the functions, capital F, that do what we want. Here's what we want our functions to do, OK? And we look at all those functions, and we look at all their Taylor polynomials at one point. OK, by asking to compute this set, what we're asking is, OK, uh, we want a function, capital F, that satisfies uh, the conditions in the box. Before you compute F, uh, uh, tell me, please, what can you say about the function value and the derivatives of the function at one given point? That's the gamma. OK, so note. Note that this gamma is contained in the vector space of all Taylor polynomials. Note that it's convex, because of course, if I have two different functions, capital F, that satisfy the conditions in the box, 
A convex combination of them also does the same, and therefore the same is true for the jets at a, at a given point x. So it's obviously convex, but it may be empty because maybe we've been greedy and our capital M is too small and there are no interpolants. Okay? So we have a possibly empty convex subset as, as uh, uh, promised. And so what we want to do is to use that. No, if M is too small. Oh, you know, uh, I have wild data and I want to approximate it. With, okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now uh, here's a claim. Uh, so this gamma is a key tool in computing the function f and is also interesting in its own right. Well, a key tool in computing f, I mean, you'll see. You'll see something. Uh, interesting in its own right, that's, a, that's not fact, that's propaganda. Let me try to convince you. Okay, so here's a trivial example. We take a car trip, okay? So position is a function of time. We don't know which function of time, but we know, <clears throat> let's say because it's my car, which is pretty old and has been through a few accidents, uh, we know that it can't accelerate very fast. So we know that, okay? Also, uh, I, I note approximately where I've been at finitely many different times. So that's what I'm given. And, uh, and then given all that, well, what can we say about the position, velocity, and acceleration at some given time? That question is a trivial one-dimensional case of uh, the question of computing a gamma. Okay? So I, I hope that that's enough to convince you that, that gamma is worth finding out about. Okay. Now we're going to compute the approximate size and shape of the gamma. Okay, how are we going to do that? Well, what does it even mean to compute the approximate size and shape of the gamma? I'm going to, uh, I'm, what I'm actually going to compute is uh, something called gamma star. That's a misprint. That should be script P. Uh, so, so another convex set, and it, it's possibly empty. And uh, let's see, it's comparable to the gamma in the sense uh, of these inclusions. So I take the M, and the gamma star is bigger than the M, but on the other hand, if I, if I replace this m by something a bit smaller, little c times m, then that gamma star is contained in gamma. So in that sense, I'm computing the approximate size and shape of the gammas. And that makes sense because I am not, at the moment, trying to find exactly the best possible cm norm of an interpolant. Uh, I'm only trying to find the, something whose cm norm is best possible up to a factor of c. So this is, this is a reasonable notion of computing the approximate size and shape. OK, so I've got to compute some gamma stars that do that. How to do it? OK, well, now, in principle, x, this point x at which I take the, the jet may or may not belong to E. There's no reason why it should. But in this, in this talk, just to keep things simple, I'm going to assume that, that the point x belongs to E. We're only, I'm only going to discuss computing the gammas when x belongs to E. OK? Now, the plan is going to be that, that there will be um, some recursive procedure. OK, we're going to, we're going to proceed by induction. Let, let's say the parameter on which we induct is L. <coughs> Pardon me. So for each L greater than or equal to 0, we're going to, damn, we're going to, uh, we're going to define our ELF guess at this convex set. But we're only going to compute it for all the points of E. And these gamma of L will be too big, OK? They contain the gamma that we really want. But when we go from L to L plus 1, they get smaller. So we're going to approximate the gamma we want from above. And when we're, all right, and then finally our gamma star, which is our final guess for gamma, uh, is going to be simply uh, one of those gamma Ls that we computed by that recursive procedure that I haven't told you yet. Um, and we, we take L star to be simply a large enough integer constant depending only on little m and little n. So we carry through the recursive procedure, the refinement of these gammas, uh, a bounded number of times. OK? So in order for this to make any sense, uh, I owe you um, what the gamma zeros are and the induction, uh, the induction step to pass from gamma Ls to gamma L plus 1s. OK, so let's go. We're going to define these guys by induction on L. OK, so in the base case, when L is 0, what do we do? <coughs> well, 
Uh, there's the definition on the slide. We look at all polynomials with the property that all, all their derivatives at the given base point x are less than or equal to m. And furthermore, their values at x differ from the data by at most capital M sigmas. Now, our, our interpolants, capital F, are supposed to do this kind of thing at every point. So in particular, they do this at the point x. And so that's our gamma 0. So gamma 0 consists simply of all the Taylor polynomials that we could get by ignoring all the information in the problem except for one point. OK, so that's obviously grossly too big. But nevertheless, it is a convex subset of the right vector space, possibly empty. Um, and, and, uh, and it contains the gamma that we want. Let's see if that's on the slide. Yep, there it is. OK? So we've defined the gamma zeros. That certainly wasn't very hard. All right, now the induction step. OK, so let's fix an L greater than or equal to 0. And let's suppose we already defined gamma L of xm for all x in E. Well, um, if we've already defined it, we should assume that it does the right thing. Namely, they're all convex, and they all contain the gamma that we really want. All right. Given that, our problem is to define gamma L plus 1 in such a way that it stays convex, but it's smaller than the gamma L, but it still contains gamma. That's what we've got to do. All right. And it's going to be very easy to do that. All right. So we're simply going to use Taylor's theorem in, in the notation of jets. OK? So Taylor's theorem says that. Suppose you have a CM norm, and you have two points. Think of them as being very close together. And you have some bound for the CM norm. Here are the jets of the function at two points. Well, if the two points are very close together, then the two jets had better be almost the same. And here's the actual estimate with perhaps some binomial coefficient to omitted here by another misprint. OK? And this is just Taylor's theorem. OK. Now, uh, a corollary of that is that if you take any two points, x, y, and e, if, if p is in the gamma for x, then there will be some other p prime in the gamma for y that's close to p in the sense that it satisfies this inequality. And the reason is just trivial from the definition. If p belongs here, then it's the jet at x of some interpolant. And you can define p prime to be the jet at, at, at y of the same interpolant. And this is what Taylor's theorem tells you. OK, so we're simply going to use that corollary to define gamma L plus 1. OK, so um, to use the corollary, here's what we do. Gamma L plus 1 of xm consists of all polynomials in gamma L with the property that for each y in E, there is some p prime in the gamma L at ym, which has already been defined, for which we have this consistency. That's the definition of gamma L plus 1. So let's note some good news and some bad news about gamma L plus 1. Uh, Oh, you bet. Oh, you bet. So Whitney, in, in the Whitney extension theorem, which I'm not going to try to explain to you, uh, in the Whitney extension theorem, you assume you're already given a jet at every point. And, and OK, and, um, uh, okay, so the, the, big problem here, the big problem here is that you don't know the full jets. You only know the function value as you're trying to guess the jets. That's what it's all about. Once you've guessed all the jets, then uh, Maybe this would have been a challenging problem if Whitney hadn't done his stuff beforehand. But Whitney then blows the problem out of the water. OK. OK. So um, all right. Yeah, so that's the definition of gamma L plus 1. And I'll tell you some good news in a minute. But first, I'd just like to note some bad news, which is notice that in order to define uh, this gamma L plus 1 at a given, at a given x, uh, we've, got to, we've got to look at every y. So every y talks to every x. And so if e has n points, then there's no way to beat n squared work in carrying this out, whereas I promised you n log n work. So something is deeply wrong. Um, <clears throat> we'll get back to that. OK? OK, anyway, the good news is 
that the gamma L plus 1 is clearly convex. It may be empty. Let's, let's go back and look at it. Uh, gamma L plus 1 consists of all things in gamma L, such that blah, blah, blah. If you have two different p's for which, for which, uh, uh, for each y there exists a p prime, you can just take convex combinations of the p's and p primes and see that the gamma L plus 1 defined this way is convex. Okay? Um, notice that gamma L contains gamma L plus 1, and that's just by definition, because gamma L plus 1 consists of all the stuff in gamma L such that blah, blah, blah. So, okay. Uh, uh, so that's true, and the last bullet point on this slide is that the gamma L plus 1, although it's smaller than gamma L, still contains the gamma that we really want, thanks to the corollary, right? Because uh, if, P, if P belongs to the gamma we really want, we have to check that it, that it belongs to uh, gamma L plus 1. Well, it belongs to the gamma, so it belongs to gamma L. Furthermore, for every Y, there exists a P prime consistent like this that belongs to the gamma and therefore belonging to the gamma L because the gamma Ls contain gamma. Okay, so our, our polynomial, uh, our arbitrary polynomial in the actual gamma passed this test and, and so uh, that's the last bullet point. So we've used nothing more than Taylor's theorem. Uh, okay, and so now, now as promised, I've, uh, I've, I've given you an inductive machine that you can crank. It's unfortunately too expensive to crank. Each, each turn of the crank takes n squared, at least n squared operations, whereas I promised you n log n. Um, but at least we, we do have the, the uh, relevant deduction uh, uh, defined, and so we have these convex sets. Okay. Uh, and now comes, uh, comes the theorem. And the theorem is simply that you can carry out this procedure enough times, that's this constant L star, it's a, large enough, whoop, it's a large enough integer constant depending only on which function space we're looking at, in such a way that if you carry out the procedure that number of times, so you look at the gamma L stars, well, by, by construction, the gamma L stars have been made to contain the gamma. But in fact, if you make the C a bit, I mean, if you make the M a bit smaller by multiplying it by that constant C, then suddenly you have the, the reverse inclusion. And therefore, as promised, we've computed the size and shape of the, uh, uh, the approximate size and shape of the gammas. OK, so now, um, uh, let's see. Is that constructive? And the proof, the proof of this is constructive. And the algorithm, so now you might ask, so what? So I've constructed these gammas. How do I find an interpolant? And the answer is the proof is constructive. You follow the proof. OK. Um, OK. So uh, I'm not going to say, I think I'm not going to say anything about the proof of theorem 3 for the simple reason that it isn't trivial. So the constant C, some constant, or any constant less than 1? Oh, 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 uh, some constant. I, if, if that constant C were, let's say, um, 1 tenth, I would be delighted. OK. So, um, okay, so, so again, the, the proof of this theorem, as far as I know, is hard. If, if you have a nice, easy proof of the theorem, please come and see me. Is there an easy non-constructive Not that I know of. Uh, okay. Okay, so thus we have succeeded in computing the approximate size and shape of the gamma, but the computation is too expensive. That's the n squared. Okay, so again, I'm, I'm not going to say here, how the, how the gammas are actually used to, to compute the F, but I am going to try to say something about the too expensive. Okay? So the gammas, the gammas that, I, uh, that I explained to you are, in fact, not the gammas that are actually used. They're in, in the paper that's called the pedagogical algorithm, but there's some other construction of gammas that works just as well and is much easier to, uh, to do. And to illustrate, I mean, to, to, to explain the basic idea in that, I'm going to ignore the problem of CM interpolation of data and um, ask for something much easier. So um, I'm going, now I'm going to bring in some ideas from our, from our clever cousins, the computer scientists. Uh, um, and uh, I'm going to be talking about the well-separated pairs decomposition uh, due to these computer scientists, Callahan and Kosaraju, used by these computer scientists, Harpelet and Mendel, in a way that I'll tell you. Um, and there's a related thing that I won't have time to discuss in, the, uh, in this talk called the balanced box decomposition tree by uh, five computer scientists. There, there are their names. 
Okay? Um, and what we're going to do is the following easier problem. And I claim that the ideas that are used to solve the easier problem are also used, uh, I mean, are, are mixed into the, into the batter in order to, uh, uh, to, to um, speed up the algorithm for the, um, for the interpolation problem that I talked about before. OK, I have 10 more minutes, yes? I, I, have, I have five after. OK, OK, good. OK, so uh, here's, here's the easier problem that we're now going to talk about. So we forget about the previous problem. Um, simply compute the Lipschitz constant of a given function. So suppose we have a function, a real valued function defined on a set E in Rn, and this set has capital N points. Think of little n as being, let's say, 3, and capital N as being, I don't know, 10 to the 10th. OK, there's the definition of the Lipschitz constant of the function. Thank you, Charlie. There it is. OK, now, uh, the problem is to compute it. Now, if you know how to program a computer, you know how to calculate the Lipschitz uh, constant of a function. And the work is obviously, I mean, the work of the trivial method is n squared. Look at each x, look at each y. Don't do anything if they're the same. But if they're distinct, compute this thing. Take the maximum of all of them. And that obviously has work about n squared. OK, but that's merely the obvious method. There is a clever method which uses this so-called well-separated well pairs decomposition. And it's going to compute the Lipschitz constant within, let's say, a 1% error using far fewer operations, using n log n operations. OK, what's the idea of that? Well, the idea is that for certain pairs of subsets, for, for a subset e prime and a subset e double prime in e, we're going to compute the restricted maximum of the relevant quotient, but uh, restricted to x's varying only over e prime and y's varying only over e double prime. And we're going to beat the obvious uh, uh, method of computing that restricted maximum. OK? Um, yes? I'm sorry? Disjoint. Oh, they'll be disjoint. They'll be more than disjoint. You'll see, you'll see in a minute. But yes, definitely disjoint. OK. So I'm, I want the e prime and the e double prime to be well separated in the sense that the distance between any two points, one in E prime and one in E double prime, should be at least a thousand times bigger than, let's say, the sum of the diameters of E prime and E double prime. So think of here with, with some trepidation, I put down the pointer. Think of two star clusters. You know, here are a lot of stars, and here are a lot of stars. The diameter of the star cluster is that distance. The diameter of this star cluster is that distance. And the distance between one star cluster and another is more than a thousand times that plus that. That's the well-separated case, OK? In that case, we're going to compute the restricted maximum beating the obvious method. It's going to be easy. Uh, so well, um, first of all, what is the obvious method? The obvious method is to look at each x and look at each y. And so the obvious way uh, uses that many operations. And that's what we're trying to beat. All right. Now, so here are, here are a couple of simple observations. First of all. For any x in here and any y in here, if we compute the distance, it really doesn't matter which x we pick here and which y we pick here. We might as well just pick one x, this one, and one y, this one, and compute it once and for all. So the denominator is essentially constant. And so all we've got to do is compute the maximum of the absolute f of x minus f of y when x varies over e prime and y varies over e double prime. OK? Well, how does that happen? Well, to maximize that, uh, you do one of two things. Either you take f of x as large as possible and f of y as small as possible, or the other way around. Uh, to find the maximum and minimum of all possible f of x uh, takes, takes that many steps. And to find the maximum and minimum of f over all y's takes that many steps. And then to decide which of these things to do takes, I don't know, five steps. Uh, so essentially, the, the work is this plus that instead of the obvious method, which used the sum. So we've gained. So this is, this is better than the obvious thing, but this is still not the smart thing to do. We'll get back to that. OK. But anyway, so far what we know is that if e prime and e double prime are well separated, we can beat the obvious algorithm by use, by, uh, in order to compute this restricted max up to a 1% error. Okay. 
And now, now comes a theorem on the well-separated pairs decomposition. I'm, I'm just going to state it. I'm not going to say anything about the proof. Uh, so let's take any finite subset of Rn. So again, capital N is the number of uh, points. Then if you look at the set of all pairs uh, in the Cartesian product minus the diagonal, that can be partitioned into uh, a bunch of Cartesian products so that, uh, notice by the way, L is the number of, Cart of Cartesian products, okay? So that, first of all, L, the number of Cartesian products, uh, is big O of capital N. And furthermore, each one of these Cartesian products is well separated so that you can apply the previous trickery. Okay, not only that, but so, so, so far this is a mathematical theorem. No, no statement about computation, but furthermore, an efficient algorithm computes the above decomposition. Uh, I don't even want to explain now what it means to compute the decomposition. Uh, but, so, I, all right, I won't explain this at all, but there is an efficient algorithm that produces enough information. Okay, and now uh, let me just come back to deliver the coup de grace for the Lipschitz constant, which is the following. Suppose that you have found the, uh, the well-separated pairs decomposition for this given set E. For each one of these Cartesian products, let's just pick one representative, one point x nu prime in here and one point x nu double prime in here, just one. Okay, and then the Lipschitz constant for the function f differs by at most a 1% error from the maximum of the relevant quotient, but computed only over the representatives. So for each uh, Cartesian product of well-separated things, you only need to do one calculation. You only need to look at one example. Uh, what's going on here is that you shouldn't worry too much about the, uh, Lipschitz, the restricted Lipschitz constant from any particular Cartesian product. You're only interested in the maximum of all of them. And therefore, you can afford to get lots of wrong answers for uh, lots of Cartesian products that, uh, you know, that, that aren't the crucial ones for the max. And that, that's actually a, a nice, easy exercise. Um, OK. Uh, so I think that's, that's what I want to say about uh, the known case and the theorem, I mean, the, the stuff that I've been talking about for years and years. Um, OK. Now, uh, open, let, let me close with open problems. And the, the new point is that one of these open problems is, I believe, about to close. Here it is. What are the analogous results when CM of Rn is replaced, uh, for instance, by the Sobolev space of functions with m derivatives in LP? And it's, it's good to have smart grad students. And, and thanks to the work of my uh, recent grad students, uh, Kevin Luli and Ari Israel, uh, there are enough new techniques here so that um, in, in a few years, I think it's very likely that, uh, that, that comparable results can, can be given for, for Sobolev spaces. OK, uh, I'm less sanguine about the following. This is an old chestnut in, in uh, uh, learning theory. Um, suppose I give you a whole lot of points in some Euclidean space. Find a smooth submanifold that passes through or close to those given points, and this, this um, manifold needn't be the graph of a function. OK, um, so that's the previous problem plus topology. Um, it's not, I mean, the problem is not carefully formulated. Think of, think of a million flies uh, uh, perched on, on a Mobius strip. What is the surface? Anyway, uh, so this is, this is a very, I mean, I promise you this is an important problem. Uh, there are legions of people who study it. There's a field that has a name. Uh, um, but I think very, very little is known. OK, that's it. Uh, I'm sorry? You, you mean the, uh, in, this, in this problem of finding a manifold? Yeah. I, so I haven't stated it carefully. Um, and, and so any, I mean, if you can say anything about any reasonable version of this, I would be happy. And I, I wouldn't be the only person who would be happy if you could say something reasonable about some version of this. Can you say a word about how the fact of log n appears on this one? Oh, oh, okay. 
it takes, it takes work n log n to compute those representative points of the well-separated pairs decomposition. Um, what you don't want to do is to list all of the points of E nu prime and all of the points of E nu double prime for each nu because the number of such pairs, I mean, you know, that, that's, that's too big. But there, nevertheless, there, there is, there's a way of encoding the information in such a way that what you need, which is stronger than, for example, a representative point for each nu, uh, can be computed in time n log n. Uh, is, is that enough or should I say more? Okay. Go well, ahead. Sort of two related questions, Bob. I'll try to ask them as one. When you're talking about the convex sets and whether you can find something you're, you're making it sound a lot like a sort of linear programming chronicle, and if there's a feasible point or some linear program. Also, when you're talking about your car example, you put a bound on the acceleration, but assuming you obey the speed limit, there's a different kind of bound yes. on the first derivative, and so yes. you might be asking something in the unit ball in CM, you're in some kind of convex body. Where there are different mm -hmm. conditions on the different mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you sort of go into that sort of oh. with the given technology? Is that a whole? Oh yes, no, 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 no. So, so in fact, all right, you you caught, uh, I mean, you caught this this uh, um, this point that I tried to sweep under the rug. It's true. I mean, if you obey the speed limit, and if I stay in in the United States as as per my rental agreement, then. Uh, uh, th then I have bounds on, and, and, and yes, one, I mean, I, the same machinery al allows one to, to deal with that, okay. Right, right. Um, uh, let's see what to say. Um, well, m maybe the right thing to say is, is nothing more than, than I said. Um, so, so simply, yes, you can take, I mean, these, there are variants. In which, so, for instance, there's a variant in which you ask only to control the acceleration. There's a variant in which you ask only to control the acceleration and the velocity and, and the position. Um, I would have to think about whether you can impose completely arbitrary upper bounds or whether there's some relationship there that you would require about the... Uh, so, if the acceleration is at most one and the position is, uh, uh, is, is at most 100, what... what what bound are you allowed to demand about the velocity? I would have to think about it. I don't know offhand. But, but certainly one can, I mean, there are some parameter ranges for which one can impose. And, and that comes from the, same, uh, from the same machine. Also, the tolerance, the sigma. Yes. Um, well, why have that? I mean, you could just set the tolerance to be zero. Yes. And then you would satisfy any positive tolerance. But well, if you have some like applications, or you want to have some freedom in mind for, so, for some application. Oh, okay, so, so for instance, for instance, let's suppose that we have um, equally spaced points in the plane. So uh, this is going to be a graph of a function of one variable. And these function, and, and so th th these functions are going to be sampled at very, very closely spaced points on the interval. And they are going to be very, very tiny random noise. Now, if, if you look at this and I ask you, please, to fit this with a smooth function, an excellent smooth function is the function zero. But that doesn't fit the data perfectly. If you try to fit the data perfectly, you will be fitting random noise perfectly. And if you try to find the fourth derivative of that, it's going to be enormous. Uh, so, so this gives you the freedom to make the functions much, much smoother at the expense of not fitting the data perfectly. And that's what you see all the time in the real world. Um, I, I should be careful about using the real world to justify things because, again, this does not apply to any problem in the real world. It's just that I hope that, some, that with some more beating so down, we, it we could. Appreciate applications of math in the real world. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yeah. Can you speak again?